Good afternoon and welcome to the continuing series of webinars that Kenny have been putting on. Um, before I introduce the topic today, I'd like to just cover a couple of ground rules. Um, if you have questions as we're going through, please use the Q&A function uh, within Zoom, uh, type in your question, and I'll make sure that it is addressed as we progress through the conversation this afternoon. <laughs> if you have any specific issues or concerns, uh, just hit the chat and I'll pick that up from there. We won't be taking any verbal questions today as it gets too complicated with the number of people attending. And finally, uh, I want to remind you that this session will be recorded and it will be available to you uh, after the session. So let's get going. Uh, today, we're focusing on Canny's restoration of the Empire State Building's mooring mast. Um, and uh, today we have uh, Julie Foster here, who is the project manager for this venture and uh, Jarrett Huddleston, uh, principal and one of the founders of Canny, who was actively involved in this project throughout. Julie, over to you. Hello and welcome. As Stephen said, um, I am Julie Foster and this is, I'm joined by Gerald Huddleston. And we're gonna be outlining uh, the restoration of the Empire State Building's mooring mast. This is a project that started out as the removal of nine antennas and then slowly evolved into a full-scale restoration. And you can see on, on the right, a before, during, and after of, of this process. Introducing the project team, this was conducted under the direction and management of ESRT and JLL. It started as part of the 102nd floor observation deck renovation. You can see on the top um, with the sunlight gleam, that's the 102nd floor enclosed deck. This had been enlarged to increase a beautiful observation deck. We highly encourage uh, that you go and take, take a look. The, the project was contracted by Cole NYC. He's a master rigger and industrial rope, ac con rope access contractor, and then all architectural conservation and restoration services, including the investigation, uh, design, project documents, these were conducted by Canny. Some quick background on the Empire State Building itself and the mooring mast. It was built uh, right on, on the edge of the Great Depression. A lot of construction had ceased around the city, but we had a skyscraper race going on that continued. We had a handful of buildings at 40 Wall Street, which capped out at 840 feet, Empire's neighbor of Chrysler, which capped out at just over 1,000, and then clearly winning the race was Empire State Building. We capped out at 1,250 feet. Um, the mooring mass was integral to this race. It was a late addition by, by the architects Sri Lam and Harmon. Just really, it, it was advertised as being a mooring mast to dock blimps. In reality, they really wanted to make sure that they were the tallest skyscraper in New York City and therefore the world. They clearly won this race and they stayed the tallest building for 70 years. We did have one dirigible uh, dock for about three or four minutes. It was privately owned. It was really a publicity stunt. And as engineers had predicted at the time, it managed to stay moored for about three minutes before the wind uh, made it have to undock. So unfortunately, no one was ever able to take an intercontinental trip from Europe and dock at Empire and, and exit into Midtown. But over on the right, we've got photos of the construction. You can see the, the clear and utter lack of any sort of OSHA regulations. The guys are hanging out on the tallest building in the world with no harnesses, no hard hats, no ropes in sight. Uh, you can see on the upper right, the stainless steel skin that was put on. This was a very modern uh, Art Deco architectural element. And then the evolution of the mass through, uh, through the decades. Initial construction, the photo in 1931, just after um, construction was complete, the, the aluminum sandcast uh, facade capped off in stainless steel. And then starting in the 1950s, you can see the addition of the 200 foot spire, uh, which is the Empire State Building as we know it today, and the start of these antennas being installed, which by the 1990s and, and when we started on the project, the, the antennas had so engulfed uh, the mast that the original Art Deco architecture was obscured. So this history of antennas being part of the Empire State Building really started at the beginning. There were plans for radio antennas prior to the building being constructed. The first one went up within the first six months. You can see on the left, these original antennas throughout the history antennas have been put up as technology and radio and television has changed. They've been taken down. 
the spire was added purely as additional real estate for more antennas. And then moving into the 60s through the 90s, it was always always the cutting edge technology. The, the antenna you can see sticking out of the rings on the top of the dome on the upper right, that was the Alfred antenna. It allowed FM stations, multiple FM stations to transmit through one, uh, one antenna. And this was, was cutting edge technology. And then down on the bottom right, uh, the, the mast as, as it was when we started, the, the, very, the very lowest photo, it's enclosed in a cocoon that was installed to enable the enlargement of the 102nd floor um, observation deck windows. And Julie, you can see the, go back one, the, the, the upper right-hand photo is basically the original window size in that observation deck. And in, in doing the renovation, they removed the, the upper of the two lower rings there below the, the fenestration and extended the glass floor to ceiling. So that if you're now in that upper observation deck, you're basically surrounded by an unobscured uh, panoramic view that goes floor to ceiling in that entire area there. Yes, the, the renovation of the 102nd floor is gorgeous. We never got tired of seeing that view. But then as antennas go up, they have to come down. Uh, this shot we found after having um, taken the shot on the right, the, the crew from 1947 is installing an RCA antenna and they're standing in the exact same spot as the, the 2020 crew taking antennas down. Yeah, one of the principal differences in those two photographs is that the guys that are on rope <laughs> in the contemporary version are, are uh, actually uh, fully on rope and, and able to basically step off of the edge of that parapet and be suspended. They also have a separate safety line that's you know, continually attached to them. The guys on the right look like they might have a rope around their waist. They do. They have a rope around their waist. <laughs> yeah, probably not a great idea in terms of uh, suspension trauma. And it was to... probably just added for the photo. Yeah, yeah possibly. <laughs> right. So changing times. So we've got before, during, and after. So excuse me. We have north, south, east, and west. The condition starting in 2019 of the antennas at the start of the project. Uh, the initial scope was the four major antennas at the corners you can see the projecting antenna on the lower portion on the Northwest, and then three smaller 10 to foot, 10 to 15 foot antennas. These major ones are between 50 and 60 feet apiece. So the first step were inspections done by Canny. We've got 15 techs trained in um, society professional ropeback sex technician certification. And we did inspections on all four corners of the mast and then uh, lenses from far away taking photography. You can see we were working at night. Um, when we started the project, the observation deck was open during all hours of the day, except for 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So these were our windows for both work and inspections. So these are some of the, the conditions that we found on those initial inspections, multiple penetrations through, we had uh, multiple different types of antennas, and then a lot of abandoned equipment and plates from antennas that had been taken down prior. Some of the different penetration types, we found you know, large jigsaw cuts through the cast aluminum. Some of these had been patched with old cast aluminum, new aluminum, stainless steel, PVC piping. Some were insulated, some were not and then miscellaneous, just abandoned plates, equipment, and railings. There were even some that were just backed with pieces of, of uh, Lexan or plastic that had been adhered into place uh, in, in a few locations. Several of these antennas had been hastily put up in September of 2001, um, which might have led to some of the, the different configurations of, of patching. Um, you can see a lot of these conduits and pipes, how they telegraph through onto the interior. They were out of service prior to us starting and you can see where they've been cut. And then a photo on, on the left-hand side of the original Alcoa stamping. Each of these original cast aluminum panels were, were marked and they were installed by two companies from Brooklyn. And I guess uh, on, in terms of those penetrations, obviously some of those are, or a lot of them are, are conduits for the actual wiring that goes out to the antennas, but uh, there were also um, supports that came in through, through the exterior and that would have been attached directly to the structural columns of the building in order to actually support the units in place, the dunnage as it were for those, for those antennas. Yes, throughout the project, a lot of that dunnage was still in place and had to either be unanchored or sawn through to remove. 
So starting in November of 2019, the, the dream project, the observation deck project was, was wrapping up and we began our work. Uh, this, this photo was taken by Max Tui. He's a great architectural photographer who was out with us during the project. And you'll see his photos throughout. But starting in, in that November, uh, the removals. So all of this was overseen by Cole NYC, who was a master rigger. Doing the work through industrial rope access allowed us to avoid having to put up pipe scaffolding, which allowed the observation deck to remain open during the day and then us to do the work safely at night. You can see some of the complex rigging. Each piece was individually secured before being dismantled and then lowered down to a tramway on the 88th floor. Just some videos to show the height, the weather condition, and, and the condition that the, the crew was working under. We had fog, wind, ice. Uh, one more quick video. Just a few, it was hard to, to not put 500 photos showing these removals. We had to, had to pare it down a little bit, but a few more shots showing the complexity of the rigging and, and the work that the crew did to, to bring down these large scale antennas. And then as you can see, this is March of 2020. We have now moved to daytime hours. Uh, we thought we'd have maybe two weeks during the, the COVID observation deck shutdown to quickly remove as much as possible. We ended up having until July of 2020, which greatly expedited the, the speed of the project. We were able to, to load um, a higher number of crew and then you know, just working during the day, the weather is often better and just the ability to see uh, the process became greatly expedited. And then the left-hand photo, you can see the crew using additional ropes at the bottom to help control the pieces as they were lowered to the deck. And of course, the daytime work also ex greatly expanded the number of, of contiguous hours that we could work, right? Right. We went from a four-hour shift to, you know, almost a 12-hour shift. So this really enabled the project to go from being the nine principal antennas to having the time and the ability to remove all additional um, abandoned antenna antennas and then this all the other equipment. But, but talking about those challenges, I mean, COVID did present some organizational challenges, a, a couple of supply chain issues. We, we had a hard time getting bolts for a while, which was quickly resolved. And then the, the main challenge on this project really was the weather. You could have a, a beautiful, clear, sunny day on the ground and at the top you were in complete fog. Uh, sometimes the wind would be non-existent on one side of the building and you'd have 40 mile an hour on the other side. I do have to say though, we never got tired of the view and, and seeing how, how the weather would change from up top. Uh, some photos from removals as we went, this, this is a, a very small selection of, of the amount of equipment that came off. The contractor estimates somewhere between 40 and 60,000 pounds, antennas, ladders, uh, conduits, tubing, dunnage, and almost 1500 plates. And then just one last video, this is one of, of the larger pieces that, that was brought down. I think what's interesting about the videos, a couple of things, you, you, you get a sense, particularly in the night videos of the, of the, the kind of quiet that's up there, uh, obviously with the ambient noise of the other element that is almost always present at the top of this building, which is the wind. 
in some cases on particular days, work is really impossible up there. Even coming up out onto the, the upper balcony on the 103rd floor, uh, sometimes the wind is such that you can barely make your way walking around that, that balcony uh, simply because of the force. Uh, so it really obviously was a big factor in when we could and could not do this work safely. Yeah, definitely. And not to mention that sometimes the falcon would try to hunt us and not, not the birds that were up there. So moving on to the repair types, once the antennas came down, obviously the, the holes, the penetrations through the aluminum skin had to be repaired. On the upper portion of the mast, the majority of the repairs were a flat stock aluminum. And then we'll talk more about the, the repairs on the bottom in a moment. We had a, a flat stock 6061 aluminum panel. It was anchored with uh, stainless steel bolts. It was separated from the historic aluminum with a polyethylene foam tape and compatible sealants. This prevented any galvanic reaction between slightly dissimilar metals. The original cast aluminum has a little bit of silicone in it, and this did prevent us from being able to weld. And just with the, the logistics of, of so many plates and, and attempting to weld on rope, it would have, the heat would have melted the original aluminum and deformed it. You can see the installation of these plates here, uh, coordination and mock-ups, that the plates were sand cast to match the original aluminum. And then you can see the coordination that had to happen between the crew. At every single repair, you had to have someone on the exterior and someone on the interior to complete the repair. The other thing was to try to keep the, uh, the thickness of the replacement plates, uh, the skin, to uh, the minimum that was actually necessary. So we did uh, an ASC B7 to, to determine what the, the anticipated wind loads were up here because they're rather significant, obviously, and, and, and brought that metal thickness down to what was, what was actually going to be the most aesthetically positive uh, application here so that we diminished any shadow lines in the, in the, the materials that were being added uh, to the skin. Um, and then also, of course, if we had multiple uh, penetrations in one area, we tried to think about this aesthetically in terms of the number of plates. So in many cases, we replaced multiple plates with a single plate uh, in order to, to maintain the, the, the best uh, visual effect possible. Mm -hmm. We also mocked up originally a flathead bolt and, and ended up going with a round button head bolt. It was more aesthetically pleasing. Not that you'll see that from the ground, but up close, it looked better. A second major repair was a waterproofed bolt repair. As we were doing the original inspections, we could see a lot of these plates and we weren't exactly sure what we would find when we pulled them. We were pleasantly pleased to, to discover they were just held on with, with bolts and they were not hiding large penetrations behind. So instead of having to repair, you know, a, a one foot square penetration, we were just repairing um, a, a half inch bolt repair. So we designed the, this bolt. It's a button head hex drive stainless steel screw, and it is set with an interior and exterior neoprene bonded washer, and then held in place with a, with a lock nut on the, on the interior. And all of these bolts were wet set dipped in sealant for additional waterproofing. You can see the condition as we pulled a lot of the plates. Some of the plates had been separated from the from the building with the neoprene pad and therefore didn't have any of this galvanic reaction. This one unfortunately did. This was cleaned with light sanding with an aluminum grit sandpaper. And then all the excess sealant uh, was scraped off. So you can see the finished product and the, the striations you can see in the, the finished repair on the right, that was, was part of the original sand casting. And then you can see the materials and details on the left. And those were the bolts that were very difficult to get during COVID. One of the challenges was tracking those down. So down at the lower portion of the fin, we had the more challenging repair and it was these sculptural ridges. We had Allen Architectural Metals from Talladega, Alabama come out with an Artex scanner and they were able to determine the original process for sand casting these plates. They would have had a mold that, was, uh, that profiled this ridge that would have been shifted in the larger mold for each individual piece. So it was the same profile throughout the entire fin instead of changing widths. So we were able to scan at the bottom of the mass where you can see the guy sitting 
and take that one mold and shift it for the different size pieces, which was a relief because when you're doing everything on rope, everyone has to be certified. And so had the tech not been certified, we wouldn't have been able to take these molds. You can see on the left, uh, Bama Foundry did the casting, uh, exact same techniques that would have been done in the 30s with a new modern addition of Allen welding a handle on the back, which allowed for us to, to have the piece secured and then hold it in place as it was being installed. And then some overviews of, of this piece being, being installed with some great teamwork in the middle. Some of the basic challenges of working on rope is securing yourself in place to be able to do things as simple as, as screwing in a bolt. And then these are some of the compound repairs Jared was speaking to earlier. We have a large penetration with the box beam, a piece that's been of historic aluminum that's been cut and reinstalled. And then on the lower right-hand corner, a porthole, which had to be reinstalled. So in two locations, this and a, and a mirroring one on the other side, it was one of the few places where we had to remove historic material and instead replace with this large, uh, this large patch bent on a break to, to streamline the repair. Speaking to the portholes, there are 12 of these throughout. There's three on each of the four corners of the mast. In 10 locations, we were able to pull these and find the original Wilcrox and Crittenden uh, tag. This was a, a naval supply store in Connecticut. These, from what we can tell from historic photos, were installed sometime between the 40s and 50s. They're not original, but they are historic. We were able to pull these, clean the brass, and reinstall. In two locations, the box beams had damaged the original. So we were looking at trying to figure out a way to recreate these. And then on eBay, I found two from the exact same manufacturer, exact same size, and the same era. Uh, one had, had just been at an antique store and the other had been part of a couple in Atlantic City, their father's boat. So they are now very excited to see the new home um, of their porthole. And then you can see the, the installation to the panel on the lower right. Uh, moving into some of the, the custom plates, just kind of a shout out to the crew here for great work. We were trying to figure out how to scan this piece and measure it to do a custom casting, but the, the crew was able to create a configuration and, and mold this plate to fit a complex profile on the upper portion of the mast. And then you can see a very unique 88 floor workshop on the right. Uh, one last repair, there were five of these hatch doors that were cut into the sides of the mast to allow access to the antennas. It, it was a source of leaks and these were pulled re-anchored, waterproofed, and reinstalled. So these these doors, so to speak, actually went out to small platforms that were formed by the, the, the steps of the lower portion of the fins at the corners, and they had small railings that had been added to them. So in removing all of that and removing the antennas, obviously there was no longer any need for this access. Uh, so instead of replacing these with doors that were actually functional, we, we basically closed up those openings permanently. Oh, and then someone in the chat asked if the portholes had a function, and we believe they did. It was probably to bring to bring light. When you're on the inside of the mast in that location, it's very dark. They mirror portholes that are up on the dome that you'll see later, and they were they were most likely installed so there was more visibility on the interior. And then you've got the, the last step in the process was removing miscellaneous equipment. We had, to Jarrett's point, where those hatch doors are, ladders to reach those from the exterior, platforms and railings. Uh, these systems all came down as well. The last step in the waterproofing was, was sealant. We had very thin ship lap joints that were resealed with polyurethane. And then we did water testing. And I, the, the, the obviously water entry was a concern throughout uh, with multiple penetrations uh, through the mast and also some of uh, many of the original anchors themselves uh, over time, uh, original uh, uh, seals that were present, um, whether they were putty based seals uh, or, or earlier gasketed repairs, uh, a lot of those were leaking. 
So what we were doing as we went was, was also waterproofing the entirety of the mass from top to bottom in terms of the repair. Uh, and certain areas that were particularly prone to leakage were intensively water tested as is shown here in the center photograph, just to make sure that we had everything that we had done was working to, to keep the interior completely dry. Yes, there was water testing in every step of the way. After all of the, the plate and the bolt repair mock-ups and each individual mock-up, we, we went out and water tested. So throughout the entire process, Canny was on site with our 15 techs. It's the one time I, I didn't have any issue getting, getting fellow coworkers to come out and do an inspection drop on the Empire State Building. So uh, someone in the chat asked if this ever felt like a dream and I have to say it did, um, it never got boring being up there. Inspections happened um, throughout daytime and nighttime. And then you can see in these photos, some overviews of once all the antennas were down and all the waterproofing repairs were in place. And on the right hand side, you can see we have started preparation for coating. I think the left hand photo is a great one because it does actually show the, the textural aspect of the original castings. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the building from a distance, it doesn't really read as, as having this, this level of, of roughness of surface, but in fact, those sand cast elements are, are pretty, pretty highly textured. Right, and it was great having the crew from Allen um, on site talking about how, you know, they were, they were looking at the metal and saying, oh, this is from this part of the process. And so they could, they could see and understand how they'd originally been cast uh, by looking at, looking at the metal. So our last step was coating. Uh, you can see in the middle, the first time the building was coated in the 1960s. It's also a, a fun game of spot the OSHA violation. You can see the, the gentleman in the front is smoking. They once again have the, the rope waist harnesses. None of those paint cans are tethered. I wouldn't get on that scaffold and you know, not a hard hat in sight. Then on the left, is another view um, of that same day. You can see where those mesh antennas stretched across. That is where they weren't able to paint. So on the right, you can see those locations. It's the one spot on the mast where you can see how the aluminum would have oxidized uncoated versus how the rest of the mast aged. So we, we did paint analysis and testing. Uh, the paint went through several different types of testing to determine it was an alkyde based uh, resin with flex of aluminum throughout. We took several different types of this kind of paint and mocked it up for both aesthetic testing and for adhesion testing. You can see the pulleys on the left hand photo and then in the middle we're doing the, the, the tape test. And then we did a couple different preparation testing uh, for how we were going to prep the surface. The final conclusion was a light, very, very light aluminum grit sandpaper to remove old sealants and materials and, and anywhere where the paint had clumped. And then super light power washing was really more just wiping down with a hose, a final acetone wash um, prior to paint. And then you can see the crew putting the original um, mock-up up and then extending. Each panel was painted individually so that you would, we didn't have any streaking or discoloration in the paint. And how many coats in the- in We the did two coats and it is a chrome aluminum. So it, it's very similar to the original paint, flex of aluminum throughout. And it serves a dual, a dual purpose as these flex of aluminum help protect the original uh, cast aluminum um, from UV damage. And you can also see how seamless the repairs were, were blended in once it was coated. Excuse me. Um, some close-ups of the before and after. It's really not just from far away that these repairs blend, but even as you're standing on the 88th floor looking up, they really do seamlessly disappear. Of course, the re high reflectivity of the coating as it was when we were doing this, um, and, and by the way, trying to do that painting in the daytime uh, was sometimes highly problematic simply because of the, the dazzling aspect of the reflectivity. Um, if you look at the tower now, you'll still see that, that there's a uniform uh, and uh, renewed appearance, but it, it has already oxidized to some degree and dulled down a bit, so it's not quite as, as blinding as it was when we first finished the work. Oh, yeah. To Jared's point, the crew had actually bought uh, goggles that are usually used for skiing to protect their eyes while they were painting. 
Uh, then timing almost worked in our favor once again, as we were starting to coat at the beginning of July and the observation deck reopened. So 95% of the painting happened at night, which was almost a relief to the crew. Uh, so moving into the dome, the project evolved as we were going uh, to not just include the base of the mask, but also to include waterproofing and um, finishing the restoration on the dome. You can see uh, King Kong doing his initial inspection and then the original appearance of the dome. And then on the right-hand side, the appearance of the dome when we did um, our inspections. One of the major differences there, obviously, is the introduction of the, of the, uh, the, the ring at the top there, uh, which is an ice shield uh, for the upper uh, antenna array. Uh, and that obviously changes the, the profile of the top of the tower considerably. You can also see at the top on the right hand photo, you don't have the shiny reflectivity because in the 1990s, a waterproofing membrane was installed. So our first task and the biggest difference from the restoration on the mast was the removal of this membrane. Have some photos up close. The two photos on, on the left and the right are prior to membrane removal. And then in the middle, you can see, this is both a mix of cast aluminum and stainless steel. Uh, it's cast on the middle of the portholes. They were probably originally glazed with glass, though I can't find um, original photos, but they are now currently aluminum. But that drawing quote up in the upper right-hand corner does label those as, as glazed with, with yes. glass, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of these was, was one of the repairs we had to make. It was, it was damaged and had to be replaced. So the crew cut a brand new aluminum circle. You can see underneath the ice shield now, uh, the difficulties in removing this material was incredibly sticky uh, while on rope, um, but the original stainless steel on the right. So that, that waterproofing that was used was a Kemperol membrane. And uh, in this case, there were some curing problems. So that as we were taking this off, it wasn't that there was just a you know, fully cured uh, or even perhaps somewhat brittle um, uh, uh, fluid applied up there. Um, the underside of it hadn't cured at all. So there was actually just this gummy mess underneath the, the outer portion of the cured membrane, uh, just further uh, complicated the removal. But the real point for us was that this is this is really a metal building, and the vulnerable areas here are really concentrated on either damage that had been done through penetrations that have been added, or of course the original seams of the material um, or the bolts. And th those areas of vulnerability actually probably represent maybe 5% of the total surface area. Um, the, the decision in the 90s to coat this thing was kind of a, you know, let, let's, let's take care of everything in one fell swoop and not worry about the fact that most of what we're doing is actually pointless. It just made it simple to, to deal with this. Um, in restoring this, obviously, we wanted to, to counter that, come back to the original appearance of the building, and then just address those areas that were actually vulnerable to water, water infiltration. Most of those are part of the original assembly, but there are some significant deviations amongst them, probably most significantly the, the brackets uh, that are supporting the, the ice shield that you can see in the left-hand photograph there, which are compound assemblies um, that, that really have to be uh, waterproofed again with membrane to be able to account for their, their uh, configuration. Right, and you can see, I think, the top, the pen, oh, you can't quite see in the photo, but the penetrations at the top where the, where the ice shield is anchored and then the penetrations at the bottom where it's anchored, those are the two places where we will be reinstalling uh, PMMA waterproofing. But then to Jared's point, we, uh, it was part of the original scope to go over the entire dome again with a membrane. We were assuming when we pulled this that we were gonna find such, um, we were gonna find conditions that required it. So. We were pleasantly surprised when we when we pulled this 90s membrane off to find that the dome was in pretty good condition, though we did have close to 200 uh, penetrations to repair. We did similar repairs to the bottom on the mast with new plates and then bolt repairs. So you can see the the rigging and and the cleaning and detailing that was involved in in cleaning the rings. And this portion of the project is is still in process. We've got a little more cleaning to do, a few more bolt repairs, and then the painting and coating will happen as soon as we have the weather this spring. 
one of the more complicated uh, parts for the cleaning portion, there were several different repair campaigns of waterproofing that had been done on the easy access, easily accessible walls. Uh, what you're looking at is the 103rd floor celebrity deck. This is close to the public, but, but celebrities and special guests are brought up there to see the view. Um, in this location, there were several different types of waterproofing applied and you can see the crew in there in their suits uh, cleaning and then the finished on the middle. We are applying the PMMA waterproofing to the edge of the parapet and walking surface. And then the last step, there is a, a raised railing and handrail system that will go back in once we're complete. This is what uh, fans of the original King Kong movie and the old black and white one that you quoted earlier would call the Fay Ray balcony. Yes. I haven't convinced anyone yet to, to get the gorilla suit, but I, I have time. And so then this brings us to our conclusion, uh, the final product from the North and the South. And eventually, isn't the, uh, the area of the, the PMMA that's present at the 102nd floor observation deck, that's going to also be coated so that the, the finish will actually be consistent from the, the base of the mooring mast all the way up to the top of what was the original dome at the yes, um, everything communication spire. It will look as close to its original 1930s appearance that it, it has since the 50s. Uh, we are also pleased to announce that we have recently won the New York City Landmarks Conservancy Lucy G. Moses Preservation Award. And thank you all for attending from the project team. Before we wrap up, um, if anybody has any further questions, uh, you can drop them into the Q&A. Uh, we'd be happy to address those uh, now before we close. So I'll just give you a few minutes if there are any questions. Uh, you can drop them into the Q&A function. Um, one thing that I we didn't talk about that, that uh, may have crossed uh, someone's mind uh, is, that, of course, with all these antennas up uh, and operating, there are significant RF issues relative to the top of the tower. Um, when we first began doing work on the mooring mast years ago, uh, just doing small glass replacements on uh, the areas of the mast that have now been uh, fully re replaced with new glazing, um, we, we had concerns and had to work only in, in a very, very small window where uh, all of the broadcasting equipment was turned off. Now everything has been transferred up to the actual uh, upper spire. So uh, obviously there was a very kind of, kind of concerted lockout procedure that, that made sure that nothing that was remaining on the lower portion on the mooring mast uh, was actually uh, um, still live. Um, and we just had to, make, uh, to take precautions whenever we were working at the top of the dome to make certain that, that uh, there was no problem with RF. Uh, one of the questions was LPC involved in the process? Yes, they were involved um, every step of the way and they saw the mock-ups and approved the repair types. Um, how do we go, it's a great question, how do we go from antenna removal to full restoration and painting? This, a big part of this was COVID allowing us to to expedite the schedule. Uh, we went from four hour shifts to 12 hour shifts and we're, we're able to so quickly remove the major antennas. And then just, just talking, we had a, a really great project team um, throughout and just showing them the photos as we went and did the inspections, letting them see the, the old abandoned equipment up there. And, and everything was very secure when we were inspecting, but they saw the, 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 the potential for both removing these now and having those out of the way and and that this allowed for a restoration that hadn't been the original idea yeah i would say that everybody along the line there uh, from the very top uh, tony malkin and and uh, peter Schoen at uh, at esrt and uh, richard hauser uh, project manager for jll everyone was very enthusiastic uh, about the the possibilities of the appearance and certainly as we went along uh, that was just reinforced with the results uh, so we've had full support in, in, in doing this and in expanding this project actually uh, by steps to, to really encompass the entirety of the mess. Yeah, everyone saw the potential, particularly looking at the historic photographs and that we, we had the chance 
to to turn this into a full scale restoration. But none of this, of course, would have been possible without uh, without George Cole and his team relative to this access, because using IRA for this purpose saved a small fortune uh, and also allowed us the the versatility to be able to do all of this work uh, in the manner that it was actually performed without encumbering the the uh, the observation deck, which is so important to this building and to visitors to New York. And really um, having the, the crew that we had out there, their attention to detail, their love for this project as well, um, made every step, of, we had our challenges, but really every step of the way, it's been a great project. Um, we're okay. definitely excited about the restoration. All right, well, I think at that point, we're going to wrap up, I think, as one of the um, questions came in, they, you know, and Julie mentioned this, um, this description, of this project is very much a, an architect, architect's dream. And uh, I want to thank Jarrett and Julie for sharing their insights on this project. And thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we have recorded this session, we'll make that available to you. If you have any follow up questions, please feel free to reach out to us through info at canny.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. <laughs>